All right, here's our third lesson here, World War II in Europe and the Pacific. One essential question is, discuss the Allied strategy of fighting the war overall as well as in Europe and Pacific. Uh, possibly you could get a little bit of a question regarding that. Our second essential question is going to really be connected to our decision to drop the bomb, what's the reasons for and against, and I talked a little bit, and we'll go over a little bit of the conditions and things that lead up to that that influence the dropping of the bomb. The first battle in the war, Second World War, is like with the First World War, to make sure that the supply lines across the North Atlantic are open and free. The convoy system used in World War I is the same as used in World War II. Massive numbers of ship surround it, ships surround them with destroyers and battleships, uh, and most of those will get across. That significant piece of technology we talked about with the Battle of Britain also is being applied on the high seas. That is radar massive amounts of ships are going to the bottom of the ocean far more than world war one highly effective the u.s merchant marine uh those ships and that system of the shipping uh apparatus of the united states uh war economy is perhaps one of the most deadly jobs that you could have in world war ii massive loss of life across the north pacific in terms of your percentages of Possibly dying. How do we, who do we defeat first? Japan? Well, if we look at Japan, we really don't have a lot of close allies over there culturally or in any other respect. We are starting to trade more over there. It's also 9,000 miles away. How immediate of a threat is China to the United States is a big factor here. They do actually occupy a few small islands in the Aleutian chains that are connected to, chain that is connected to Alaska, and will actually invade. There will be some fighting there, but they're not considered to be the immediate threat. Uh, threat. Germany is. Reasons why. One, they're closer. Easily. Two, we have a long history of cultural roots, ties to Europe, especially Britain and France, just like with World War I. Three, Britain is only the only base left to invade Europe with, to bring supplies, people, stage, plan, prepare. If Britain falls, then an invasion or attack has to happen from much, much further away. And then we start to consider technology. The German military machine heavily invests in scientific advancements to come up with new weapons, rockets, jets. These things are known as being factors in the decision to decide that Germany has to be first. And this rocketry you see here, this technology is going to be utilized in the Cold War by the Americans, by the West, by the Soviet Union. Actually, some scientists are going to be captured from Germany who will be utilized on either side to develop the space programs for those two countries in the Cold War. They'll get a little amnesty for that as well. No war crimes for those people if they agree to help out and come to America or go to the Soviet Union. It was an old brainer for the most part. And the most frightening thing was the notion that there was some atomic research going on. And this was reflected in Einstein's letter to FDR in 1939. We all know Einstein. German technology atomic research was scary beyond all belief. He mentions that some other individuals like Fermi and Szilard, you might know some of these people if you're into the science world, uh, have done some experiments that lead us to expect that, you know, possibly some very significant uh, sources of energy could be developed and utilized in the immediate near future. The administration might want to take this quite seriously. He gives some recommendations that it is probably a good idea to find resources for uranium, make sure we have control of them, know where they're at, they are in Canada. Germany has recently just secured resources of uranium in Czechoslovakia. Uh, for what reason? And for the reason of supplying some of that stuff to some of their scientists. Going a little too fast here. We should get together with the United States, should make sure that we have an eye on who's using this stuff, who can uh, conduct some experiments for the United States government, have an eye on university laboratories. We've got to get up to speed here. This was a frightening thing. So Germany was clearly the way to go. How do we fight? How do we attack? What's our strategy? How do we do this? The United States won an aggressive attack, launched right away into uh, the main part of Germany, or 
Germany and through France into what we would consider to be probably present-day Normandy. Britain said, that's ridiculous and crazy. You Americans are stupid. They're too strong. It's too secure there. We would be defeated. If we were defeated, it would be a huge moral blow. It would set us back years. We need to do some wise planning here. Attack into North Africa, where Germany has invaded and is looking for oil resources. They're expanding down into North Africa and looking to the New Middle East as well. Let's get some victories down here and come up through the soft underbelly of Europe in through Italy. And then once we've built ourselves up and we've got some air power over Europe, then we can invade through that famous D-Day invasion through Normandy. Cross-channel invasion, largest ever from Britain into northern France. 1944, FDR gets his fourth term in office. It's going to lead to an amendment later on in the future to limit that thing type of thing from happening ever again. The Allies uh, are going to, at the end of the war, leaping ahead to 1945 here, four years worth of this for the United States, are going to controversially slow up or stop or allow Britain, excuse me, the Soviet Union to attack and invade through the eastern portion of Germany and take Berlin. There's a lot of criticism because we allowed them to have Berlin, the capital city, and this sets up a division of Europe, or excuse me, Germany in the future. Hitler commits suicide on April 30th, 1945. A week later, Germany surrenders. May 8th is VE, or Victory in Europe Day. Everybody celebrates, but it's not over yet. Notice the dates here. May 8th, mid-April, going the wrong way. April 12th, FDR just sees the end of the war here in 1945. Warm Springs, Georgia, he dies. Cerebral hemorrhage, has a terrific headache. Truman is the president. His vice president, only of weeks. They got rid of the other, the other vice president, got a new one in the election of 1944 to make sure we had the right person to get the right number of votes to win the election. It's Harry Truman from the great state of Missouri. As soon as he finds out that FDR is dead, he tells Eleanor, boy, is there anything I can do for you? She said, oh, no, don't worry about me. You're the one in trouble now. What can we do for you? And she was probably right with that. The earth and the stars all on my shoulders is basically what he said. So he has this great decision that's coming up. Uh, are we going to use this thing, this new weapon called the atomic bomb? And right away he makes a statement to the, the world and the allies that there's basically going to be no end to this war until every vestige of resistance remains. And uh, he doesn't even know about this new weapon, the atomic bomb that's coming up uh, from his president until the president is dead, and then they tell him about it. So we move to our second essential question, the war in the Pacific. It's a different kind of war. Geography dictates that, but also so does the opposing side. The enemy dictate that as well a little bit, especially with our Pearl Harbor situation. Massive area. What's different here? It is different, a bit different, in the sense that it is kind of a racial war, to say the least. You see this in the cartoon here. Driving like sap, helping for Jap. Don't waste gas. Don't burn rubber. These will be things we'll talk about that are highly rationed. Tokyo Kid, and you see how they're just displayed here, something evil, something devilish. Both sides really have a superiority complex early on in the war. So there's some American thinking that, you know, this is not going to be that difficult. Uh, they are not going to be that solid of fire, strong of fighters. Uh, it's even some of the pilots can't be that good because they have squinty eyes, and it was uh, rationed. Uh, ra the rationale was that they didn't have good eyesight, and so therefore they couldn't shoot well either, and all that kind of thing. They all both have racist views of each other. Japanese really see in Nazi fascist thinking that other races and other cultures are impulsive, weak, and not as good as the Japanese. They've been trained to think that way, especially in the military as well. They rarely allow themselves to be taken prisoner, and in terms of treatment of prisoners, the Japanese are quite harsh. They really don't follow the rules of war that have been established by the rest of the world, and for that reason, there is going to be a higher degree of intensity of fighting here in the Pacific. Terrain and climate are driving things. It's tropical, it's hot, it's humid. Thick vegetation, poisonous things, tropical disease. It is massively huge. 18,000 islands. Now, they're not all right in this area, but there's thousands and thousands. You take all of them, you try to attack or invade every single island the Japanese have taken, and they've taken quite a few. Not going to do that. That doesn't really make sense. One of the most important weapons in all of this, in this strategy in the Pacific, is going to be 
the aircraft carrier. This aircraft carrier is going to be able to deliver massive amounts of firepower with the planes that launch from it, in some cases bombers that launch from it, uh, and the United States is going to produce massive numbers of them. And fortunately, with Pearl Harbor, three of those aircraft carriers escaped destruction in that big event. How do we win the Pacific? What is going to be our strategy then, considering everything? We're going to take islands only that we can use and that the Japanese have developed and therefore can't use since we have them. Uh, we're going to starve the rest out. A little typo there. Go ahead and fix that. It's going to save time, materials, money, and people. And this is a duplicate, double duplicate here, but basically we're going to have a guy by the name of MacArthur Island hopping from this direction and a guy by the name of Admiral Chester Nimitz of the United States Navy hopping from that direction in a two-pronged attack in the Pacific. Meanwhile, Asia, again, a significant amount of territory has been taken over by the Japanese after Pearl Harbor. Guam, Wake Island, these are islands that we gained from Spain after 1898. And if you remember also the Philippines, the Philippines are going to be attacked and invaded in December 1941. They're going to quickly drive uh, the United States out of those chains of islands. And General MacArthur, who was basically the dude that was the United States general who was commanding things there, uh, escapes and says, I shall return. But thousands and thousands of American soldiers and some British soldiers as well uh, were captured and sent on this thing called the Bataan Death March uh, and forced to march by foot uh, 60 plus miles, dying along the way, not fed, not given sufficient amounts of water, forcing, uh, forcing each other to basically do horrible acts of violence and brutality to their comrades. Uh, if they fell, they might be bayoneted or shot, that kind of thing. And this comes out. And this comes out into the media. This comes out to the rest of the world. And it has a major impact on our view and our delivery of force against the enemy. So 1942, there's a significantly low degree of morale after Pearl Harbor. And FDR pushes his generals to strike as fast as possible against Japan so they can be of the mindset that we can touch them, they're not untouchable. Uh, and we do this through some, a very famous first, it's called the Doolittle Raid. You can see this in the film Pearl Harbor, uh, reenacted, and some bombers launch off of big, heavy, slow bombers. Usually they need a long runway, launch off of these aircraft carriers and drop bombs on various points in Japan. And it was a one-way ticket. They were supposed to then jump out of their planes, barely have enough gas to get to China and be rescued by people in China. In retaliation, Japan, soon after that, launches a attack on the Midway Islands. Notice where they are from Hawaii. This was considered to be the turning point in the Battle of the Pacific and the whole Pacific War. Major victory here for the United States forces in that they kind of knew that they were coming through uh, having intercepted information uh, of from the Japanese and broken some codes, and the tide of the battle from here in the Pacific on will be continuing that the United States will squeeze and squeeze and keep pushing them back for the next three years into the end of, toward the end of 1945. So their goal here was to draw out the U.S. Navy and finally destroy it. It doesn't work, fortunately. This is considered to be high water mark. Massive losses for the Japanese, losses for the United States as well, but significantly different. Again. This puts us on the offensive. It's the high water mark of Japanese power in the Pacific. It's going to go backward from there. By the time we get to 1944, uh, some major battles, uh, major, major battles happening in the Philippines. This guy MacArthur returns, walks back on the beaches famously, as you can see in this picture, and we get to the point of the last major battles that really have an impact on our view of how do we conduct the end of the war how do we finally bring the islands of Japan under submission? Well, it's going to be pretty tough. One, the first example of things being exceedingly tough, tougher than anything seen in Europe and to the Pacific up until this point, is the invasion of this famous place called Iwo Jima. It is about halfway from Guam, uh, which is going to be strategically important so that bombers from Guam can then go ahead and fly to Tokyo, bomb it or other parts of Japan, and then come back and land if they're injured, saving untold lives. Uh, highly strategic, but it is fortified by 21,000 Japanese soldiers, been there for years, tunnels, caves everywhere, connecting everywhere. 
They have orders to kill 10 before they die. And it's bloody, 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 bloody. Thus the famous flag raising you've perhaps seen before. If you want to see a good film uh, in regards to this, you can see a film called Flags of Our Fathers, directed by Clint Eastwood. Uh, it also uh, has a companion film with that that uh, highlights the experience for the Japanese soldier as well. After, so the fighting there is is literally uh, to to the last person. There is uh, very few uh, very few that uh, surrender. Uh, there is in instances at Iwo Jima of soldiers uh, basically giving up themselves or Japanese soldiers surrendering and then you know throwing a hand grenade or killing themselves, exploding a bomb or something like that. Basically, uh, suicide bombing type stuff happening. Uh, and so the fighting here is sending a message that it's getting tougher. And it does get tougher as we get closer and get closer to another island called Okinawa. Uh, it is actually Japanese soil. It's part of the Japanese uh, island chains and archipelago. Uh, it's the last step for the invasion of Japan. And again, it's also a big island. It has air bases there and facilities to support continued attacks and continued bombing from that island on the mainland. Uh, 130,000 are there. They're going to fight to the death. It's here that we see uh, the kamikaze pilots uh, happen and occur and be utilized. Pilots who are trained to take off, uh, but not trained to land. Their planes are stripped down, and basically they're told to turn their, themselves and their planes into missiles on a one-way ticket to sink, sink as many ships as possible. And you can go on YouTube and see all kinds of, of uh, footage of this and how it, uh, it kind of looked. Uh, but it is uh, like nothing else ever seen before. It's so intense that uh, as they found some of these individuals who crashed into American ships, uh, one of them in particular uh, was found to have been chained into his cockpit so that he would not jump out uh, to make sure that they were going to deliver that plane into the side of the ship. And this way they were going to destroy the ship and the fleet and perhaps get the United States to come to a terms of surrender or terms of in terms of peace to end the war. March 1945, we're bombing uh, the mainland of Japan, major cities in the southern part of Japan, especially in Tokyo. Uh, and what they're utilizing here is incendiary bombing, bombs that start fires. And if you know a little bit about J Japanese architecture, especially at that point in time, some of the original ar architecture, traditional architecture was heavily out of wood and paper walls and things like that. It's highly combustible. It kills massive numbers of people, numbers that challenge and surpass, in some instances, those that die in the atomic bomb droppings. Messages were sent out, end this war, give up, or you will face massive destruction. The American public is getting tired of it. It's costing a lot of money. There's estimates that the war could cost hundreds of thousands to millions of lives if the war was continued into an invasion of the absolute of the actual Japanese mainland islands. And this is a flyer uh, that was dropped on Japan by American forces to the people to try and get them to encourage the government to quit and to end things. You can pause this and check out the transition, translation if you like. Uh, but uh, this atomic bomb is the other option uh, as opposed to a direct invasion of the mainland. It was tested in 1945, July, in Almogrado, New Mexico. It does work. We're going to have two more of them available. Nobody else really knows that, of course, uh, but it is created by this thing called the Manhattan Project, and these are the different sites where it was developed in pieces and parts, Los Alamos being the most famous, another one, Oak Ridge in Tennessee. So, again, this was the project that got started out of that Einstein letter about what Germans might be doing, and again, Truman just found out about it a few weeks or days or not very long after he was sworn in as president. So we have this meeting in Potsdam in Europe between Churchill, Truman, and Stalin, and it is at this meeting that Truman issues a final warning to Japan, surrender unconditionally or you're going to face complete and utter destruction. It was kind of thought that maybe, you know, Stalin didn't know about it at that time, that we had this, he already knew because there were some spies in the United States. But uh, this message, if you look, look at it and read through it quickly in terms of how it was worded otherwise, uh, it has some criticisms of it in that it doesn't say that we have a bomb that will wipe out an entire port or an entire city. Maybe we don't want them to know that. Uh, so perhaps 
some would criticize and say perhaps we should have told them about you know what this bomb could really do and maybe that would have deterred them but in the aftermath that probably wasn't going to be enough either because we had to drop two of them Hiroshima August 6th the little boy bomb was dropped first and then three days later, after there's no response and continued requests for surrender, they drop the next one on Nagasaki. It is known as Fat Man. Some pictures and images of what it looks like. You can see all kinds of other stuff out there. A few days later, Emperor Hirohito convinces the military to surrender. He announces it for the first time. People hear his voice in Japan. The war is over. The J Day, Victory Over Japan Day, happens August 15, 1945. The treaty ending the war signed on USS Missouri by General MacArthur, officially ends the war on September 2nd, 1945. Effects of the bomb, about 70,000 killed instantly, uh, 40 for Nagasaki, and times, and time over time, of course, radiation poisoning, all that kind of thing, thousands more are going to be injured, and many, many more are going to die later from radiation. Uh, there are still survivors of this. There were some American prisoners of war and Americans that were being held there that died in this as well. Not that many, comparatively, uh, to Japanese. But for and against, he's criticized. The United States is criticized for dropping the bomb. Why we shouldn't have? Some will say, or in the argument we've made, that Japan's ability to fight was very minimal at the time. The military was in shambles. Their supply lines were really getting shut off. We could have just squeezed them down and... They could have starved, basically, to the point of not being able to fight anymore. Uh, there was words and uh, notions and ideas out there that there was some sort of a message to Stalin uh, to uh, that, saying that he was wishing to end the war and that Stalin could have been a mediator, but it was ignored. Uh, the Japanese workforce was dependent on women and kids, uh, that kind of thing. And to a, a democratic republic like the United States, America just doesn't use this kind of weaponry. Uh, it's just a, and it's a bad image and why not test it somewhere else on a deserted island to show them what it would look like uh, Give them an idea for what it would look like to scare them uh, Let's do that first and then they have the whole notion about okay We explored it now and then what next in the next 50 years? Maybe atomic weapons and the technology spreads to other countries and a whole bunch of countries have it uh, This is known as nuclear proliferation. This is a concern yet the present day Massively so maybe more so than them uh, because of the fall of the Soviet Union and terrorists and terrorism and all that kind of thing. The arguments for using the bomb, well, one, we save American lives. Uh, the public just not going to stand for the war going any further and costing the number of lives that are here, especially after we see what things were like in Okinawa and Iwo Jima. The public is just tired of it. Uh, we are also wanting to end the war soon. And you might add this off to the side here a little bit before Stalin gets in the war in a conference called the Yalta Conference. He promised that once things are done in Europe, they'll come over here into Asia, and he was. And so if the Soviet Union comes uh, into Asia, wherever Stalin's going to be, how do we get rid of them? How do we, we're, the more time goes on, the more communism spreads. Try something new could be also an argument. The reason why we were pushing for it, some, some geopolitical things that are going on here. Again, here's Stalin expanding, maybe expanding in other places. Huge amount of money. We spend all this money on this war, and then we invade, and then if people were to find out that the democratically led government of the United States had a massive bomb that could have ended the war months or years earlier instead of invading uh, by land, that would like to be the death of the Democratic Party. The public would just be in complete disgust over that. So, all kinds of reasons and arguments for it in terms of those geopolitical issues, morality issues, we should to save American lives, morality issues on the other side, and you also have this revenge factor. Treatment of POWs, they stabbed this in the back, it was at Pearl Harbor, they, they, they just deserve it. This is our opportunity to get back at it. Casualties of the war, there they are, they're massive, especially the Soviet Union. Huge numbers, huge numbers comparatively. Two world wars in all of this now for them. You can see maybe why perhaps in the Cold War they tend to be a little bit defensive and very closed off and suspicious of the West. Of course, the communist philosophy, they were suspicious anyway. In the United States, about 300,000 deaths, a million injured. The Holocaust, of course, is going to be even more shocking. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Get your reflections done, do a little left side, 
a little bit of a Snapchat, uh, snap chart for each one, maybe a rough mind map for each essential question. Get it done quick. Make the hay. Have a good day.